Welcome everyone to Tech Talks number 13. We're going to be talking about classroom management tonight and uh, I hope that we can have a dialogue about what works and what doesn't work in your classroom and perhaps find some tips and tricks and tools that will uh, help you uh, improve uh, your classroom. Uh, my name is Lucy Gray and I am here on behalf of Rio Salado College and the Ed Rising program. And everyone is welcome to attend these, so please spread the word. Um, we have three more, I think, webinars scheduled between now and the end of August. And uh, they're free and open to anyone, any educator who would like to attend. So please help us spread the word. Uh, this is a link that will take you to our original flyer that listed all the topics and dates and gives you more information about this webinar series. All the materials and recordings from these webinars will be available um, on an ongoing basis forever. And you can find them in our Google Classroom, and I'll show you where to go for that in a moment. Right now, to access the slides that I'm showing you right now, if you type into your browser uh, search bar, bit.ly slash tech talk 13 slides, you'll be able to uh, look at these slides um, separately from the webinar and add them to your Google Drive if you want to refer to them in the future. They are, um, again, available just like the recordings to you on, uh, from now on. In the slides, you will find that I'm going to mention several different tools today, and there are screenshots of these tools in the slides and you can click on the pictures and it will take you to the website for that tool. Also in the notes for those tools, in the slide notes, you also will find the link to the tools that are mentioned. Um, I've also put some additional resources in our Google Classroom. And Google Classroom is actually a tool that's great for managing uh, the digital workload in your classroom. It is free, it's part of the G Suite of Tools for Education. And I believe they're rolling out a new version of it um, in the next few weeks. So uh, it may look a little bit different than ours um, if you try to, to use it yourself. Um, I know that there's some big changes coming, I just don't know exactly when. So to get to our Google Classroom, to our setup, if you haven't done this before, you're going to go to classroom.google.com and you're gonna log in using a Gmail address that is um, not affiliated with a school district. Probably your personal Gmail, if you have a Gmail account, will do. If you use your Gmail address from a school, your, your site administrator may have not allowed you to work in other outside Google Classroom setups. So this will just circumvent that and you can use your own personal account and that way you can get to classroom.google.com um, when you get there, you're going to click on a plus sign in the upper right hand corner and it will ask you to join the class and you enter the code that's at the in step five here. And here it is in larger type, YXFLGJ7. Uh, and that will give you access to our classroom. And once you're in there, you can see all of the topics and resources that we've shared um, during the past couple months. We have lots and lots of goodies there uh, that are free and available to you. Um, and if you missed a webinar, you can always go back and look at the recordings. I'm a little bit behind in uploading some of the recordings and I need to go back and make sure they're there. So they will be um, in the next couple of days. So about me, my name is Lucy Gray, uh, G-R-A-Y, and I am old and gray, as I like to say to my uh, son and daughter. Um, I am a former classroom teacher and technology coach and consultant turned uh, educational technology director for a private school outside of Chicago. I just started 10 days ago and it's very exciting. Um, and I'm your personal tech coach for the next few weeks and am available to help you solve any dilemmas or answer your questions regarding educational technology. You can find me on Twitter, Sometimes I use the hashtag EdRising at Rio, 
and my email and LinkedIn profile are also listed on this slide. Uh, tonight we are covering, um, we are addressing the ISTE standards. ISTE stands for the International Society for Technology and Education. It is the professional association for people like me. And there are standards for students and there's standards for educators that are available there. And you may want to take a look at them sometime. Um, I really like these standards because they are more about developing mindsets in, in children than um, than you know how to turn on a computer you know things like that might be actually kind of second nature to kids now so take a look at the standards and tonight we're really looking um, our material that we're covering tonight for the standards for teachers like you are covering the learner standard and the leader standard um, you are improving your practice by learning and uh, from others and exploring proving and promising practices that leverage technology to improve student learning we're certainly going to uh, focus on strategies and tools that will help you do that and you are also um, You also are a teacher leader by being here and you're looking for ways to empower your students and to improve teaching and learning So these two standards are definitely addressed in tonight's professional development our topic is uh, employing classroom management strategies in a digital classroom and There are two things I want to talk about a little bit and this is what we're this, these are our objectives. Um, I want to talk about tips for managing learning in your in your one to one scenario, and I also want to talk about. Um, let's skip ahead here for a minute. I also want to talk about tools. Okay, so we're going to be talking about tips for managing things in tools that will help you do that. So I want to stop for a minute and break out of my slides for a minute and uh, ask if. Patricia, do you know of any, what are some typical classroom management issues that teachers might face, particularly beginning teachers? Do you have any ideas? Um, you can use the chat or you can unmute, I can unmute you. Um, okay. I hi, I can hear you. Hi, Patricia, how are you? Um, I would say that um, I'm not teaching yet. I'm taking classes to become a teacher, but in my time that I've been in classrooms as a paraeducator in the elementary classroom, I'd say um, the biggest thing is to um, the kids uh, running around and talking all the time. Okay, the getting on. Okay, excessive talking is, is yeah. one thing. Um, I would say maybe being off task, not listening. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. It's been a long time since I was in an elementary classroom. I taught first and second grade for a long time. So I should have, I thought we'd have throngs of people here tonight who could give us ideas. So I didn't think of things to put in here. Um, I think, uh, I think younger children particularly need structure. So, um, so problems can be, you know, maybe a lack of routine, you know, no or weak routines. I don't know how to do that, but I think kids really, do well when there's structure to some degree. Um, sometimes I see things in yeah. classrooms where yeah. there's too much, too much seat time. And little kids, hey Kim, and little kids need to move around a little bit. Hello. Hey Kim, how are you? We're brainstorming classroom management issues, Kim, and I'm sure you know, you, you know of several. But what do you see in elementary or middle and high schools that are problems um, for teachers, like in terms of figuring things out, either with technology or without technology? So um, I, I'd say uh, in high schools and middle schools, there's a lot of issues with um, cell phone distractions and um, and doing um, not on task, um, you know, with uh, when in in uh, one to one device situations. I, I this is a problem with my own children, where their um, their teacher has said we're not using our laptops right now, or says something like we're researching this right now, and then they catch 
one of my kids playing a game. <laughs> so these are some realities that classroom teachers have to deal with with technology, particularly in middle and high schools. And I think there's getting to be a lot of concern with how much screen time all kids are, are using and if it's beneficial to them. And I, I think the jury is still out about the best way to manage it, um, how to deal with kids who may have a tendency to be addicted to their, you know, their screens all the time. And ideally what, what the amount of time is, is healthy for kids. I know that um, the, there's an early childhood association out there. And I'm trying to think the name of it. Um, the National Association for Early Childhood Educators. Let me see if I can find it. And they have um, NAEYC, N-A-E-Y-C, recommendations for technology. So there's been, you know, I think we've always been concerned with the littlest ones. Um, and what and, and how that affects them. But we also, I think, need to be paying attention to the older kids because I see it being a parent of teenagers as, a, as being an issue. And so I think it's also about um, helping students figure out what they're, what they're how they're, it, it's part of wellness education for kids. How do you manage screen time? How do you manage um, devices? How do you attend in a classroom um, when you have these things um, in your, you know, at your disposal all the time. So there are a lot of things that we're dealing with as educators that there's no clear cut answer. And I just started a new job where um, I'm a tech director at a school and I'm going to be meeting with parents soon. And I'm sure that a lot of these questions are going to come up. So, um, so I don't know, does anybody have any other thoughts about this, about classroom management and kids and technology and how they're managing it? Any thoughts or observations? Um, uh, I think you've kind of hit on, for, for me, uh, a lot of those transfer, whether it's elementary or, or, or high school level. Um, certainly, I think we thought that technology would help us keep kids on when we were thinking about classroom management that they would just be so excited that they you know still weren't going to talk you know those types of things but we're not seeing that that's actually the answer and um what i was going to share with you because you were talking about naeyc is that i just read and i like you said there's there's probably hundreds of resources out there but they're now calling it digital dementia oh. um so it's this balancing that running into uh, with our kids to where um, they're, uh, because we're not engaging all of the neurons correctly all the time, what they're saying is that they're experiencing kids, young adults who don't have the ability to remember or figure out um, how to process through things. Um, so they're calling it digital dementia uh, because because they're not being forced to remember things as much, which is, a, I mean, we all think it's a great tool because we can just go find the answer easily, which is a true statement, but we're, we're, we're struggling within that ability to retain and then process if we can't quickly have access to the technology. So you leave them alone without the technology and they're not able to put together a process or, or, or problem solve without it. Now that's a generalization. I get that. Yeah. Uh, but those are some of the concerns about the way our neurons are firing within kids. I think our brain, I think the research is showing that our brains are being rewired. It's not just the kids, it's the adults too. And so, you know, what are those implications? I think we're kind of in the wild west when it comes to all of this. Um, I know that I've been saving some articles because I know that they're going to come up when, um, and I deal with parents, and I there was one the other day too that you guys might find useful. So this is not quite related to, um, you know, to classroom management, but you know, it's something to think about in the context of it. This is the one that caught my eye on Facebook. Yeah, uh, somebody uh, maybe Ruby's talking. I'm gonna mute her. Um, so this one. This one I thought was kind of interesting. Electronics in the classroom lead to lower test scores. And I haven't read this 
super carefully. Um, but A, there are a couple things that bothered me about this article that came out um, just a couple days ago. You know, you know, their their test scores are five percent lower than they than you know with kids with digital devices and kids who didn't. Well, it's five percent that significant. Um, our test scores, the be all and end all of learning. Um, you know, what's the how do you um, justify the or how do you how do you count for in the study for the quality of the teaching? <laughs> you know, um, this is actually for college students. So I thought it was kind of interesting and. I think as digital educators, it's, it's part of, I'll put the link in the chat, um, it's part of our obligation to kind of think about what are, how are we handling all of this and um, <laughs> what does it mean for our students, whatever, um, however they are. Um, I see that Kimberly just joined us in Ruby. Do you guys have any other classroom management issues or know of anything that you've seen in your observations? or in your work that are, are, are difficulties for teachers and that they're, they're coping with, either with technology or not with, with, without technology. Um, I would, if you have any other ideas to add to this list, I would love to hear. Yes. Go ahead, Kimberly. I found and still find that a lot of students, especially when it comes to testing, they do not know how to use the technology correctly. So they're trying to navigate through the tablets and the Chromebooks, in addition to maybe having those academic challenges where they cannot read or they don't understand vocabulary or the wording of the questions. So they just tend to just go click, click, click straight through on the Chromebooks or the iPads just to get through the assessments or the testing. And they really don't have a full understanding of how to use um, the technology in addition to already having some academic challenges. So to me, it's kind of almost like a double jeopardy. Yeah. Because they're, they're scored on when maybe they could have gotten it right if it was worded differently versus the way it was presented on the technology that they're using. Do you think this is a socioeconomic issue, like kids who maybe come from homes where there's more technology and experience with technology are not gonna run into this? Whereas kids who haven't had access? I don't because I've seen it, I've seen it on both ends. I've seen it at the school where I work now, as well as I come from so I don't think that's as significant uh, or plays as much of a role as it is once again knowing how to use the technology and having a full understanding of it we think just because kids can get on an iPhone and they can yeah. play games that's not the same because that is not they're not being manipulated like for testing or assessing versus casually playing a game or getting on the iPhone, what have you. That's not the same. So do you I, I know at the school that I worked at yet last year, um, the teacher of third grade, they were all trying to train their kids in how to take the, the test uh, at the end of the year assessment. And they were so concerned that it was just the mechanism of how to use the technology Absolutely. was going to affect those those test scores so much Absolutely. so there's no so i think in i want to i'm trying to think kind of all common core stuff is digital from what i understand i believe which has forced a lot of schools to buy technology but just because you have a flurry of devices in your building doesn't mean anybody knows how to use it well this is also true with working with in, um Undergraduate students who are, you know, young and coming out of college, everybody assumes, well, they're young, they know how to use technology. Well, they know how to post to Facebook, but they don't, or, you know, Snapchat, but they don't right. know how to, to integrate it. Right. So, so it sounds like there needs to be, just like we used to practice with bubbling tests, you know, when we, you know, filled in circles, we need to have some sort of practice mechanism on the, on the devices itself to get kids ready for the test. Is that what you're, you're saying? Correct, and in addition to that, not just students, 
um, not only the students, even teachers that don't, don't know how to use the technology and the technology is in, in their school, but um, they don't have training on it or there's not enough time for them to get the thorough training on it. Uh, for example, okay, the Promethean boards or smart boards, okay, that's been around for years, but there's some teachers who've been teaching for years, but they don't know how to use that in the classroom. So I, I'm, so I wonder if the reality in, in schools, whether you're, whatever kind of school you're at, wherever you are in the country, my impression from people I've worked with and talked with um, is that we're all over the place. And some schools have really invested in a strategy for how they're going to prepare their kids and some schools have not. And this is a little bit off topic, but I, wanted, I, I think you guys might be interested in this. So I'm in the process of writing a chapter of a report for UNESCO on mobile learn. It's a mobile learning report. And, I, and my task is to describe this Future Ready Schools program. And this comes from, I'll put it in the chat, this comes from, um, and this might be something you want to pass on to your principal or future principal or whatever. Um, but it, it started from the law, it started with the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, and they held summits around the country and asked superintendents to pledge, and I think we can look at the pledge here, to do certain things in their district in order to um, have a robust program um, in their schools and to modernize their schools. And so a hundred teachers came to the White House, this, this was under Obama, and you know, participated in, this, in the first summit and signed this pledge and then have been working to do these things. And the next step of this was they came out with a framework that has seven gears that you need to plan for in order to have a robust, not, they don't call it technology roll up, but a personalized learning environment for your students. And so um, these seven gears and the framework is, is up here, um, you can drill, there's an assessment for schools and you can drill down and, um, you know, get all your stakeholders to participate in surveys and gather data about what's working and what's not working in your district. So um, as a result of this, I've been interviewing five schools that are part of this um, and they're all over the place. A couple of them are in California. Um, I think probably the most impressive one was the Vancouver Public Schools in Washington State. They've been, they were doing this work way before Future Ready was a thing, um, but this validated what they were doing. So there are some districts that have done it, but it's not, it's, it can't be done in a piecemeal way. It has to be done in a thoughtful, planned way, and professional learning is a big part of that. You cannot skimp from it. One of, my, one of the other ones I talked to was a school district in Alabama, really, really impressive superintendent. And I, uh, Tala, Tala Diga, I think is the name of the school, county school district. Um, they, yes, you, oh, so are you from Alabama? Originally, Kimberly? Are you no, in Alabama? from Atlanta. Okay, so, okay, Alabama. close. So this, um, what they, they had two close. schools, they had 17 schools two of them were struggling and they were going to redesign the schools and they decided to, they, didn't, they ran out, they didn't have the money to do it. So physically they were gonna redesign these schools and, and rebuild them. And they decided to retool them instructionally. So they decided to go with a project-based learning instructional focus, which I think is really important. And then technology was a lever to, to do that. And so they had this really authentic context for leveraging the technology. And um, they just rock stars in their planning and what they were doing. And everybody was on fire in their district because they were excited, they empowered their teachers, uh, they let people experiment with things. And that's not always the case, as we know in a lot of schools. So you know, as you guys start your careers, pay attention to those, those school districts that seem to have it together in this way. Um, this is just one, model of helping schools become more modern. Um, but there's also other programs out there. There's another place called the League of Innovative Schools out of Digital Promise that also has some interesting schools in there. So um, let's keep talking, but I want to make sure I get to the good stuff that you came for tonight. Um, and I think you're spot on about professional development and 
kids having digital fluency and so on and so forth. And, and hopefully some of the ideas that we talk about tonight will help you. So, um, so things to keep in mind in terms of tips and tricks. I'm going to get back to my slides here. Um, <clears throat> the first thing um, about organizing your classroom and that sort of thing is being, or it, you need to be organized first and foremost. If you're not organized as a teacher, it makes life really hard for you and for your students. Your kids will thrive with routine and, um, and procedures for everything, and that includes technology. The other preventative medicine from keeping your classroom together and having your students behave the way that you want them to is you have to design um, engaging lessons. If your lessons aren't engaging, you're less likely to have off-task kinds of behaviors. And, and that's, it takes a while to kind of get the hang of it, but keep that in mind. The better your lessons are, the less likely you are to have issues. Um, the other thing I would say is it's important that your assignments and projects have really clear instructions and that they're scaffolded into parts, into different kinds of, um, you chunk it up for students. For instance, when I was a middle school computer science teacher, all of my fifth grade kids made an iMovie uh, about themselves and as a way of demonstrating that they had some ability to do different digital skills, like they could harvest uh, images from the internet and take pictures of the digital camera and film with a video camera. There were a bunch of different skills that were involved in this project. And I had a checklist. I saw them once a week for a year. And this project probably took, um, I don't know, a couple months to do. But I had a checklist for them of exactly what they needed to do. Um, and a rubric would also be helpful in this kind of scenario. And they got that checklist every time they came to my room and they worked at their own pace to do what they needed to do with a deadline in mind. And every single kid by the end of that period or that quarter had a movie produced. I was really amazed by them. They were great kids. And, um, but I think that the way that I designed it so that they could go at their own pace, they knew exactly what they had to do. They had some freedom and they also loved to help each other during this time. So, um, I had 125 kids and they all had got something done. And what was lovely about working in a computer lab like that is that I felt it kind of even the playing field for a lot of kids. I had a lot of super bright kids, but I also had some kids that struggled with learning issues. And you couldn't tell in the classroom because things were, um, you know, differentiated for the kids essentially. So, you know, make sure that you're really clear about things and, and verbal instructions, you know, that I learned that early on teaching little people. Over, you know, with verbal, with little kids, yes, you have to be verbal because maybe they're not reading yet. But um, different kinds of signals also help kids. Anything visual helps kids um, in general. If you're working with technology, you might want to have some of your high flying kids who are great with technology be your helpers and have some sort of tech team. Um, if you're working with younger kids, with older kids, you might want to find a kid that needs to move around more in your classroom who can help you. Um, but having some students that are kind of appointed or, and this could rotate or be the same kids every time, um, gives those kids a special role in your classroom and also gives you a helping hand. You also want to, um, if you're in a, in, a, in a school that has a lot of technology, you want to have some procedures for how the kids are going to use and manage the technology. For instance, if you have a cart of Chromebooks that are available to you, um, you have to figure out how to check it out from your school, um, however their procedures are, bring it to your classroom, and then you have to think about how are your kids going to pass them out, how are you going to monitor them, so if a kid um, damages them, what happens? There are a lot of things to think about and to kind of keep track of. And so um, in that scenario, I would have make sure the devices were numbered and I would assign a number to a kid on my class list. So <clears throat> the first kid in my class list would get Chromebook number one. And that way you can kind of keep track if there are any issues with a particular device, you can track it back to the kid and say, hey, what happened here? Um, so that's one thing I would do. So th having things labeled and a routine for who gets the devices, who passes them out, um, is really important. 
in high schools, particularly, um, we, there were issues when, you know, a teacher's trying to talk to students and they have their laptops in front of them. This is also true in college. And you want them to focus, instead of on the screen, they want, you want them to focus on you. And so a lot of teachers will ask students when they'll have some sort of signal and say, you know, screens at 45 and the kids have to move their screens at a 45 degree angle down so that they, that's their signal that they need to look up at the teacher and focus on the teacher. So having like little kinds of cues like that, regardless of the age is really important. I've also seen high school teachers, um, you know, feel, I think they feel like probably phones are the major distraction. Some schools ban them, but st kids still have them. Um, I don't think banning them is a good thing. Um, I think you could actually design lessons to use people's mobile phones if there are no devices in your school. Um, but if it's a problem or you need to manage it and control it a little bit, I've seen teachers in my daughter's school have kind of like, um, you know, kind of a set of cubby holes, like very small cubby holes at the, in, the, in the beginning of the room and the kids come in and put their phones in there as they enter the room. And so it's out of the way, it's, it's, they, they're not sneaking under the table, um, there's a place for it. And if they need to do a project with it, then the teacher lets them go get them. So think about how, you know, regardless of the age, think about what the routines are, how are you going to manage this, um, and anticipate problems before they happen. The other thing that I think is really, really important, especially in schools where the, there's, um, every kid has a device, you need to move around. Um, you can't sit behind your desk. And actually, this is probably true regardless if you have technology or not. Kids, if you're if you're if there's proximity to the kids, they're going to sit up and pay attention, and because they know you're watching. Things happen when teachers are behind the desk. I don't know if you if you guys saw the video I showed last time of uh, the packets video of the kid who who uh, was was fed up with a teacher who just gave them large packets of work and mm -hmm. got up and gave a speech to everyone about right. how, remember that? Um, and, and so and see he was, correct, he, was sad. he was spot on, wasn't he? Yes. So like excessive seat work. I mean, that's not why I think we're paid to be educators. I think we're paid to kind of engage our kids as best we can. Are worksheets evil? Not necessarily, but you know, doing seat work all the time is not how kids learn best. And um, and there and if you have technology, um, you can present different opportunities that might be a little bit more engaging to kids. Sometimes you have to write. Sometimes you have to write papers and that sort of thing. But how can you mix it up a little bit for it and avoid that packet syndrome? Um, and then the other thing is. Involve your kids in, in the rules and that sort of thing that you're establishing if possible. So um, schools have policies. I just looked at my new schools one, um, you know, kind of do's and don'ts with technology. And, and you have to spell that stuff out at the school, at the school or district level for parents, um, you know, pr sometimes for legal reasons and that sort of thing. And they're called acceptable use policies. The name has shifted a little bit to responsible use policies because it's a little bit more positive sounding. And you could have your students actually draft maybe a subset of this um, in your own classroom. What are our norms? What are the expectations here? What can we all um, do together? Hey guys, I'm recording. Um, my kids are getting ready for bed and making noise. Um, anyway, so you might want to involve your kids in developing these routines, developing these policies, um, and having them have some voice in things. I think kids, again, want to be acknowledged. They want to be empowered. They want to be good. Um, so how can you involve your kids and give them a little bit of say in the matter? And then finally, I, would, I think it's really important for any kind of either tech management or behavior management in the classroom to communicate consistently with parents. And we're going to look at some tools that will let you do that. Um, but you know, tell them what's going on in the classroom, use technology to communicate with them, um, and that, that also will reinforce what you're trying to do in your classroom. So those are some important things to think about. Um, I also started thinking about some um, kind of technical ideas just off the top of my head, and I wanted to show you a couple of these things. So um, 
timers, I'm always, a, I'm a big fan of timers with teachers and with kids. If you, um, if you go to Google or in the search box in, in Chrome and you type in, you know, timer, you know, 30 minutes, um, oops, one to do, do timer, let's see if it'll work. There, it does it anyway. It, um, this timer will start, will start in Google. And it will make a it will make a sound at the end of that time period. You can also switch it to a stopwatch. Um, and there's a little doodad here that will um, make it full screen. So sometimes when I'm working with teachers and I have them doing an activity for professional development, I'll put up a timer or a stopwatch and say you have this amount of time to do this activity. And it just and I and I make it full screen on the projector so that they have a visual reminder of when the transition's gonna happen next. A lot of kids do not do well with transitions. I know, because I have a couple. Um, and so you might wanna think about um, doing something like that. Um, you could also use your phone to do it. And we talked early on in, um, in this series about Chrome extensions. If you're using the Chrome web browser, there is one that I like a lot called One Click Timer. You click on, you go to the Chrome Web Store, you click on the blue button that says Add to Chrome, and then it's going to pop up on your Chrome browser somewhere. Um, it's in my, I have 5 million <laughs> right now, so I can't find it, but it's in here somewhere. And so I can pop this out and, and do a timer as well. I think the Google method is probably the quickest and the easiest. Oh, here it is. Maybe I don't have it activated. There it is. So that's what it looks like. Um, let me bring it back up. And so I can, um, and that's the sound that it makes, which is kind of obnoxious. Um, but anyway, so there's some timers out there that I think help kids manage time and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is um, you may want to look at, you know, every, teachers love Pinterest in general, but Going here or Instagram, or I used to use something called Flickr, um, you might get some inspiration for classroom management ideas and, and ways to decorate your classroom and that sort of thing. A lot of, and, and back in my day when I was in the classroom um, as a third grade teacher, um, you can just type it, go to Pinterest and type in classroom management. Um, when I was in the classroom, uh, people, there's lots of stuff in here to, to inspire you. Um, the big thing when I was in school is to have, you know, job charts like this, but also to have these stoplight kind of um, these charts where, you know, the kids start on a green card, and if I had talked to them once and I went to yellow, and if I had talked to them another time, it went to red. Well. Uh, there's some philosophical issues there. I have friends who are very progressive educators who think that, that it's public shaming. Um, and they really, really, really hate that kind of behavior mod kind of approach. Same thing, we used to write kids' names on the board and put a check next to it. You know, how can you, you know, how can you design a classroom management system for yourself that's respectful of kids? and creative and, and allows you to teach. And I, it's very easy, um, when I started teaching, I was in schools where people yelled at kids and used these kinds of methods. And it's about control, it's not about getting kids to engage. So we could spend a whole like hour talking about people's views of this sort of thing, but just think about like, how can you be positive with the kids and what are the repercussions for the systems that you're, you're choosing? Um, so Pinterest is a really good way to get some kind of inspiration. You might want to take a look at Instagram and that sort of thing as well. So let's talk about some tools um, that might help you manage things a little bit better. First of all, there's instructional tools like using Google Classroom. And if you didn't catch it at the beginning, Google Classroom is rolling out a new version soon. I don't know when, so it should be new and improved. You know, there's digital there's digital management of, um, of managing your classroom. And so learning management systems like Google Classroom or Edmodo or whatever will help you stay organized by managing the digital piece of things. 
So that's one way to do it. But there's also other tools out there that help you kind of keep track of kids. Um, one of my favorite teacher blogs that I think is really thoughtful and well done is The Cult of Pedagogy. Uh, Jennifer Gonzalez is the author of this, and she also does a podcast. And she, um, she says she, her, everything she does is fabulous. And I bought the other day, um, she, on Teachers Pay Teachers, she has a guide to technology. And I just was curious to see how she had done this, so I plunked down $25 and bought it. And I want to show you what it looks like a little bit. Um, and it's linked in our Google Classroom. But what, what she's done is... She's taken just about every tool out there. Oh, there, there goes the, there goes somebody's weather alert. I thought that was my timer going off. <laughs> anyway, so here's, this is, um, she's organized different tools and, um, and, and, you know, written reviews about them and that sort of thing. It was not cheap to buy this, it was $25, but she put a, t a lot of time into this and it's worth it to me if somebody comes to me and says, you know, do you know of a tool that does this and that? I know about a lot of tools, but there's some in here that I don't know about. And I, and I found it helpful tonight when I was planning um, the tools I'm about to show you. So for sure, take a look at our blog because it's fabulous. But if you want to know more about digital tools that will help you in all areas of your instruction, uh, look at our book. So this one is um, class charts. So it's behavior management and instant seating charts. Um, it's mentioned in, in Jennifer's um, ebook there. Um, what I don't like about this, I couldn't really look at it. Um, it's apparently um, AI driven, so I don't know how that works. Um, but it, you can't, you have to get a demo. Uh, there's no free trial or you can't just create an account and go. And I don't know if that's because they're a startup they're based out of Oak Park, Illinois, which is near me. Um, but this is a way to kind of do scene charts and also kind of monitor their, their behavior as well. Um, this one is really, really interesting. And there is one teacher, out, uh, there, are, there are teachers out there that are using this and have invested heavily in it. Classcraft is a gamified environment. And I don't know enough about this to, to go into depth about it, but they've created game, gaming environments for learning objectives and for behavior objectives um, that you want kids to be able to do. And there's one particular teacher, it's in the notes um, for this slide, if you look at the slides when they're not projecting, um, his name is Michael Matera, who's done a ton of work with this. The downside of this is that it t there's a big investment in setting up your game through Classcraft. And, in, and that maybe not all teachers have time and energy to do that. But if you're looking for something that's going to possibly appeal to kids um, and, and be customizable, this might be for you. I don't know if it's free. I think probably a certain version of it is free to teachers. Um, and then, you know, if you want to do it school-wide or whatever, there's probably a cost for it. Um, this is the one that I wanted to really show you. This is, um, some of my friends in the ed tech world are opposed to this, um, but I think it's how you use it. So Class Dojo is a startup out of San Francisco, and it is, um, they have a trial in here, I'll show you what it looks like. And I think it's totally free, I could be wrong. So, um, this, here's a demo class. So you put your kids' names in there and you can connect it to parents and parents can get updates of things. So here I have a class of you know Brad Pitt, Cameron Diaz, so on. And um, I can go in there and give her feedback during the day about what, what's not good and what's, what's good. And so some people think this is really kind of a a, a creepy way of, of, of tracking kids' behavior. But I've worked in schools where there are kids with issues, and you know, you'll do anything to kind of engage them in the process of things. So I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't know if I personally would use it in the school that I'm in right now, but for the people who do use this, they love it. So Ruby, so Ruby, they use it in your school? Tell us about it. How, how does it work? Do people like it? 
In K3, they use it? Okay. It might be a little kiddish. I think you could use it with older kids, though. I, I don't think I would use it with high school kids. Um, so, you, so, you, so I just gave Cameron Diaz a one for that. And if you're in a one-to-one -one district, I mean, I would think the kids would see these on the devices, you know, um, you know, right away. They also have, and parents, you can, I also like to, the, the parents like it. I have one friend who used to hear from the parents, like the teacher all the time, and it really annoyed them. Um, it was like kind of excessive. So I think you have to be careful with how much you're communicating with the parents um, and be cognizant of if they have mobile devices and that sort of thing to do this. Um, what I noticed when I went in today to look at this is they're also starting digital portfolios. And I think this is um, in response to another tool that I want to talk about called Seesaw. So um, not only is this a behavior piece, oh, yeah. you're also going to be able to put up student work and parents will be able to see it. And personally, I like, I think that's really powerful. Like I want to know, I, even when my kids in high school, I would love to see what they're doing. I mean, it's not like I'm going to, it's not because I want to judge the teacher. It's because I want to understand what's going on in the classroom and have a conversation with my kid about it and know that they're having some interesting learning experiences in school. And um, so, you know, it used to be the teachers, you know, back in the day, teachers would have websites, even high school teachers, and they might put up some examples of student work. And it was fairly public, and you could go and look and see what was going on. Everything's kind of behind closed doors now. Like, I can't go look at my kid's Google Classroom set up. Um, and teachers don't put up a website with their stuff so I can kind of see what they're about. It feels like I've been shut out to a certain extent. And I don't take it that personally, but you know what I mean. Um, Google Classroom does have a parent alert feature. Um, and my kid's science teacher last year hooked me up to that. So when he had an assignment coming up, I would get a notification. But it wasn't very exciting. It was very easy to miss in my email. Um, and hopefully that's improved in Google Classroom. But, you know, all parents want to know what their kids are doing. They just want to know that you know your, their kids really well and that you like their kids and that you have their best interests at heart. And so these tools can, can help you kind of track that sort of thing. Um, so this has been super, 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 super popular. If you're looking for something, like, this is interesting, they have, you can, you can turn on quiet hours where you're not getting notifications. And I think I would do some training with parents around using this too, so that they know how to manage it, like maybe at open house night or something. Um, if you want something that's a little bit more simple, and I did not put this in my list of things, um, it, I would use Remind. Um, this is a company that I did some work for a couple years ago, and it's basically a text, a way to text your parents without, um, and, and high school students, I think kids below 13, there has to be permission. Um, you can text parents without giving away your phone number and that sort of thing and, and have a group communication with them. And this is another Chicago, it was started in Chicago by a guy that had learning disabilities and he had a teacher that really went the extra mile from, with him as a high school student and he wanted to develop a tool that would facilitate better communication between teachers and students. Um, it's free. There have been some changes, I think, in the past year that have made people a little um, leery of it. I, I don't know what's going on with it right now. Um, but, you know, try this out. It's a very, very simple tool, but very, very, very powerful. So that's one mind. Um, what other fun stuff do I have up my sleeve? Okay, so we've got um, Class Dojo, which most of you guys have probably heard about. This one, this one's kind of crazy. This is definitely for primary. Uh, hey, uh, Lucy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was I was just gonna say the interesting part about boy, I just lost the name of the one, the the texting. Uh, yes. Uh, remind. The texting one. Oh, remind. Is okay. that parents also? Uh, and, and again, this is not, there's no research behind it yet, but I think the interesting statement is parents are saying that now they're getting overwhelmed by text messages, yeah. just like you said a little bit about emails. 
And yeah. so it's getting lost. They'll say that it's getting lost in the text message. So it's, it's almost like you can't win for trying in terms of communicating with us as parents sometimes. Yeah, I think so. And I, I know, um, I think a lot of schools are taking an approach where it's, they're using all channels possible. And I think unless you've been a parent, it's really hard to know what's going to work. Like, um, my feeling is like, I don't know how I would, I guess emails in general, I would prefer, um, I f text, I probably will see it more readily. Um, school, school, my, you know, my kids coaches tweet and things like that. I I'm definitely not going to see it unless it's happenstance or I've made, I've set something up like a, a Twitter list to kind of monitor things more closely. I find Twitter to become like this river of information and I jump in and jump out. And unless I'm looking at somebody specifically, I'm not going to catch, you know, an announcement on Twitter. I mean, that's just ridiculous to think about. Um, and then, I mean, like there's, so I think schools are struggling with like, what, what's the right tool set? Um, what, what do they use? Um, something, school messenger. I think this is what they use at my school, at my son's school. So they'll send a note, and, and, and often some of these tools will also, this is more kind of a district-wide school notification system. Sometimes these systems also give you interesting data behind the scenes about who's opening up things and, and that sort of thing as well. And then you can make some decisions on what's effective based on that data. Like, and, you, and remind you, you used to be able to see who had looked at your messages somehow, from what I remember. I haven't used it in a while. Um, but yeah, I think over in, you know overload of information is 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 difficult. Um, I haven't figured out at my new school how things work in that regard, so it should be interesting. This one, uh, so so Ruby says um, for my high school kids, I received two voicemails and two texts of the same messages. So Ruby, my guess is you are signed up into their system. They probably use School Messenger or something like that. Um, there's another one called like Web Dude or School Dude. Um, you're probably in the system twice somehow. So maybe you can email them and ask you to, to check and take you out. Um, but yeah, these systems are not foolproof at all by any means. Uh, a lot of those larger systems will also work with, you know, one of the issues that schools have to deal with is what works with what. So very often, like if your school is using PowerSchool for grades, they want systems that work with power school so that you put data in one place and it goes to everything else. Oh, you know, yeah, Ruby, you could, I bet that's what it is. I, you're absolutely right. I bet you're getting two voicemails and two texts because it doesn't account for more than one child in the school. That's interesting. Huh. Okay. Anyway, let me make sure I get through all these cool tools. So go noodle. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, it's not that crazy, but for primary grade kids, maybe older kids would like it. Um, um, hang on, let me present it here and click on it. Um, so this is, what I like about this is, I don't understand why, I think kids need to move uh, regardless of age. I think adults need to move instead of sitting there all day. I, I know that I'm kind of going nutty um, in my new job when I'm sitting too long. And so what happens here is you sign up for free and there are these crazy videos that kids dance around to. And you earn points as a class the more the more that you participate in these banana, things. Banana, Patterns in the air, patterns everywhere. Patterns made of shapes, patterns made of great. Patterns on the cheetah, patterns on my feet. Patterns in the nap, patterns in the spread. Oh. Make a pattern, make a pattern, let's make a pattern. All right, cool. Make a pattern, make a pattern. So I bet these guys are famous with the K5 set, you know. The <laughs> so um, when you get in here. Lucy. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Lucy, I use this um, in a special ed class last year. Every at the end of every day, we played this um, almost every day for between five and fifteen minutes, and, and the kids, kids uh, they just 
adored it. They loved it. And it's a <laughs> couple of days that we did not do Go Noodle. It was like the worst thing in the world for them. And I've seen first graders uh, in gen ed using it as a great, uh, you know, break in the morning. And I also have, uh, we would use it uh, when it was too hot for us to go outside for recess. Yeah. We would have indoor recess and we would put it on. So we, there are some yoga things and exercise things. And oh, it was really? Awesome. That's such I a need great to idea. go noodle at the end of the day. Okay. And, and so you get more points. So if you see at the bottom here, I've watched one video, so I've got one point. So it's at, as a class, something must happen when you get We to didn't do end. anything. We never, you know, we didn't do anything with the points or anything. I didn't know there was even points. We just played the music and let them rock. And just, I just think it's nice. Like, look at this, build compassion. Like this, this just seems appealing to kids um, with, you know, without being cheesy. Like it's well designed. It, you know, it, the music is tolerable for adults. <laughs> um, that's good to know. So yes. like, I, I, yes. this is, um, I wonder how older kids would, you know, like middle school would, would like this. Um, I don't know anything else about this company. I don't know. I think it might. Yeah. So uh, that's good. That's good feedback. Thank you, Patricia. Um, that's good to know. Let's see what else I've got here for you. A um, couple other fun things. Some of these are apps. So this one is an app. It's uh, for i. It's for iPad and iPhone. And it's instead of using like you might um, have a tin can on your desk with kids' names on popsicle sticks and pick out of you know out of the can for various activities. This lets you assign customized questions to kids somehow. It's a formative assessment tool, more than a, a behavior management thing, but I thought it was kind of cool. Um, this one, how many classrooms could use this? This is an app that is a noise level meter <laughs> um, for your classroom, and it, <laughs> it's not free. Um, but I could see using this if you have your own personal iPad or I, I'm assuming it works on your iPhone. Um, this is something that you could, you know, project or have displayed in your classroom if to keep the noise down. Um, I think that would be kind of fun to try out. There are other products out there that um, let you can control computers and iPads and whatever. Um, this one I've never used but you could be at your own computer in the front of the classroom and then see what everybody else is doing on their thing. This is not my, and then you, you know, there's also, um, God, what was it called on the Mac side a while ago? There was another one called Apple Remote Desktop. And I used it at my first, school, my second school. And um, it was, if you didn't want to get out of your desk and move, it was a great way to see what kids were doing and, and, and they would see like eyeballs on the screen you know, that if you were looking at them and I could send them messages and freak them out. Um, it, it seems a little kind of big brotherish to me, these type of tools, these kind of remote desktop um, things. And there are a lot of teachers out there who want to control everything. And so they don't think, they don't trust kids. They don't believe, and frankly, I don't think they believe in kids that much. They don't trust kids and they don't want kids to be empowered. And so they want to lock everything down. I think these tools kind of lend themselves to that. But I bet you it's all in how extreme you are with these, with these things. Maybe there's a, a, a case for using this periodically when um, you want to show them how to do something on their own screens, you know, instructionally. I don't know. Um, but there are products out there like that. Um, Apple has something relatively new called Apple Classroom, and it's – and it allows you, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one iPad situation, it allows you to monitor what the kids are doing on their iPads. And to, it has, it's, it's kind of similar to Google Classroom, too. I think you can shoot out um, content to kids and that sort of thing. I have not used it because you have to be set up in a school with iPads. And I, you can't do it like on your own iPad, I don't think, um, at home. You have to be in a classroom scenario with this. They also have another one called schoolwork that goes hand in hand with this. So at my new school, 
I'll, I'll be learning how to use this um, and showing it to teachers. So I'll be able to tell you more about it in a week or two. Seesaw is a portfolio app and they use it at my new school. Um, we're gonna be digging into it in a lower school in particular. And I think teachers are probably gonna be required like once a month to post at least one thing that they want parents to see. Um, again, parents want a window into the classroom and when you have the parents on board and you have students that are producing work for an authentic audience, um, and I think it just builds a lot of goodwill on both parts. So Seesaw is one that I would take a look at if I were you. Um, I want to make sure and I'm over time as usual. Group Maker is another app that I thought you guys might find interesting if you're looking to quickly make custom groups for, um, you know, for reading groups or for, you know, small, you know, project-based learning or whatever, this will, you put your kids into this and then you can, you know, auto-generate different kinds of groups. And it's $1.99. You would put it on your phone. You wouldn't, this is not something that you need for the whole class. Um, and then finally, um, there, you know, we talked about Edmodo. We've talked about Google Classroom in terms of managing the digital work. There are a couple other things that you might want to take a look at. Otis is a learning management system, but it's more. And it's developed by two teachers in the Chicago area. I believe they're both still in the classroom. One of them's still in the classroom, the other one's maybe a tech coordinator. And they received seed funding and investors and, and have developed into this pretty robust, and I haven't been in there for a while, so you, I'm sure there are a lot of changes recently, where you can. Um, organize digital content, monitor lessons, give assessments, and there's a social emotional learning component to it, which is what they call classroom dojo. I mean, that's what they're trying to do is, is build up social emotional learning skills. Um, and there's something in there now that relates to social emotional learning, and I have not looked at it. Um, there's a certain version of this that's free. Uh, I would take a look at this if you're looking for kind of a school-wide solution. And I'm actually thinking about taking a look at it. The, um, one of the people that works at Otis has a kid, I think, in, in my new school. So I want to, um, I want to see if it's something that we should be adopting for our lower school. We use in the middle of school and high school. We use something called Haiku for managing student work. So I don't think they're going to change that this second. But for lower school, this might be a solution. And then the last one I found that I have not taken a look at in depth here. And it's very similar to Edmodo or Otis or whatever or to any other learning management system is Spiral. And I hadn't heard of it before. So I thought maybe it might be kind of cool for you guys to check out if you're looking for another scenario like that. What I want you to do for next week is try one of these tools, play with it and report back um, to us what you thought was the most interesting or useful. Um, and then we can have a discussion about this because I think the what I really love about our webinars is is your input and and tapping into your experience. So take a look at something, see if you recommend it or don't recommend it. In um, our Google Classroom, there are a series of articles that I've posted tonight too, and you might find something else in there um, that you might want to try. And uh, there are a lot of good articles in here. I'm trying to think which one I thought was the best. Um, this one was, there was a lot of good, comment, Common Sense Media had some really, really good tips and um, a cheat sheet of, um, of, of, of I, uh, I thought there was, a, here it is, Classroom Management Apps and Websites. And I didn't, um, you might want to look through here and see if there's something that you like. So find a classroom management tool or app that you want to play with. And if you have time and inclination, do that this week. And then tell us when we start next week, our, 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 our webinar next week, and we can um, talk about it a little bit further. So we're getting down to the nitty gritty of our last few webinars. Um, on August, so August 15th is our next one, which is next week. And we're going to be talking about collaborative PD. If you want to do more things like we're doing here that are free and open and you can jump in whenever, I will have a plethora of ideas for you and people that you can connect with. And then um, August 22nd, we're going to talk about how to, how, to do a, how to search effectively online 
and and how to help kids do research a little bit better and what some of the options are there. Being an effective searcher is really, really important in, in this digital world. And then our last one will be on August 29th, and we're going to talk about digital citizenship and how you can um, find lessons that teach that and, and what that means and all that. So that's kind of our plan for the next three weeks, and then we'll be done. Um, any questions, comments, um, anything before we wrap up? Oh, there goes somebody's timer. That, that's my timer. I, I had a timer going, and now I don't know where it is. Stop, timer. There it is. <laughs> See? It ran out. <laughs> Perfect timing. Okay, yes. Yeah, so go go ahead. Pardon me? What would you suggest as far as lesson planning using either any of these apps or digitally because what I'm trying to do for this year with my students is to um, do as much digitally um, I mean as from a teaching standpoint not just with the kids using the iPads or Chromes or whatever um, because it really saves a lot of time we don't yeah. have that much time in the classroom in one sitting and just try to get away from as much paper, pencil as possible and do things where we can do like group learning stuff uh, other than just showing a video or something like that. But so, to actually plan lessons around. What grade level Tim, can really remind me again? I teach uh, special ed through third. Third grade? So I would use Edmodo because you can organize everything there. There's an app for it as well. You can do it web-based. For each grade? For each grade? Yeah, I mean, so so this is what Edmodo looks like. Um, and by the way, they had their online conference yesterday, which was awesome. And um, I did some work for them. I just finished doing work for them. And they should have all their sessions up on YouTube at some point for people to look at. I think it'll take a while to do it. but. Edmodo, um, I think it's easy and simple. You could use it with first graders, you could use it with 12th graders. But it, it's kind of like Facebook, it has kind of a Facebook feel to it. And, um, and they're, they're retooling it right now. I don't know if it's rolled out to all users or not. Um, but that's how it works out. So anyway, here's what I've done with it. Um, uh, let me find a good example. Um, Okay, so this was a group that we started for a professional development event at the Texas EdTech Conference in February. So there's one main group, and they're posts in the middle here, like on Facebook, and the ads you can ignore. Um, and I can put in assignments, I can put quizzes, I can do polls with them, and there's folders of content that I can make available to them and that sort of thing. And then I've made subgroups for, you know, you can make small groups. So like, let's say you have three different reading groups, you can make subgroups within a group for those, for those different, you know, in order to differentiate. I worked with a teacher who was a fifth grade STEM teacher a number of years ago. And she and I went to a conference in, another conference in Texas and she forgot that she hadn't left a uh, social study and all the kids had tablets and she forgot that she hadn't put out a social studies lesson for the kids and like in the elevator going up to a session in, in the conference she was like typing into the app what the kids needed to do for that assignment she managed everything either you know through this platform she could organize all the materials and give them tasks to do so, um, I mean, there's a lot of training materials and things like this to use. I think this is pretty, pretty good, and it's free. Um, you could use Google Classroom, and Google Classroom is going, you could do the same thing with Google Classroom, and it's going to be more streamlined. You're not going to see ads, um, but it's not as social. In Edmodo, they also have a, um, they have something called Spotlight, where you can pull content Oh, that's not Spotlight. Um, I don't know where it's gone because they just read here. It's under here, Spotlight. They have a whole library of free and some not free 
stuff that you can pull into your lessons. Plus, there are a lot of groups um, and ways to interact with other teachers to learn from them in Edmodo. In Google Classroom, you're not going to get that social networking kind of space. Um, back on the main page for Edmodo, um, where you would network with other teachers is something called topics. So um, you can join these topics, which are basically groups, and you know network and get ideas from other English teachers or special ed teachers or whomever. So I feel like this is a fairly robust platform that gives you lots of different options for learning, for doing your own thing with your kids, but also interacting with other educators. Google Classroom is going to be much more straightforward, and they're ruling, um, they're rolling out new changes soon. So it's really up to you, but those are probably the two best options, I think. Does that help, Kimberly? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anybody else that have messages, have any uh, questions or anything like that? Um, in, in terms of, Kimberly, too, let me, let me, I'm just thinking of another thing, too, by the way. We talked about, I thought you were here for this session. The session before this, we talked about lesson planning. Um, and there's tons of resources in Google in this in the in the session before this on lesson planning, on effective lesson planning, and on tools for lesson planning. I went to town okay. with this. So this this particular post here, these are all tools that are for lesson planning. If you want something that's kind of like oh. where you write stuff out, kind of thing. If you're looking at a digital platform for delivering content to your kids then I would do Edmodo or Google Classroom, probably. Okay. All right, what's your next Thank question? You. Um, going forward, like in future classes or whatever you do after these are complete, um, can you provide like re references for like conferences that we could go to to like get some hands-on experience and information? Yeah, or absolutely. anything like that? Let's let's talk talk about that next week because collaborative PD I think is our, our our next topic. Are you in Arizona too, Kimberly? Or are you somewhere else? I'm sorry. I'm in, I'm in Arizona. Okay, so um, there is a there is a there is a chapter of ISTE there called AST A A Z T E A and Oh, I sent that to, I put that to, I meant to send that to there, everyone. Okay, there it is. Um, and let me see if I can find their website. And I don't know how, how strong of a chapter this is, but they used to have a conference every spring and informal get-togethers. So um, that's one, just off the top of my head right now. Um, oh, okay. Wow. I will look at that. Then there is a group that does these informal free get-togethers called EdCamp. All over the country all over the world it's a really really cool model um, and sometimes they do let's see if there's one coming up in Arizona so this is where this is the directory of ed camps these are teacher led um, it's not talking at people it's more collaborative and discussion based and they're free typically right um, and uh, what's your what's your what, what's your postal code Eight five three three eight. Eight five three eight. Eight five three three eight. Oh, okay, sorry. Let's see what's near there. Uh, well, Tucson. <laughs> there's one coming up in September. Um, okay. So you can, you know, there's a, and then they they provide the link to where you register for it. You guys could start your own ed camp at Rio Salado. Um, last year we did a, a mini conference at Rio Salado. Um, I did it with two guys from or, uh, another community college in, in California, a friend of mine works for. And Ruby would be the same thing, I think. Let me, let me put yours in. Um, I think you're going to get the same, same selection because I did it within 300 miles. Um, let me try it. Um, so anyway, we did a small conference because there was funding for it. Um, at Rio that was in person and was awesome and you know I don't know if they have 
it's a lot of work. So I don't know if Kim has the, Kim Toby, who was here earlier, has the bandwidth for it or if there's a funding for that sort of thing. Um, but there mm -hmm. seems to be a need for it. Yeah, Ruby, you've got the same two options that are available to you within 300 miles. Um, and then the last, the other thing too is I would reach out to, my, one of my favorite people in the ed tech world is a former principal at, um, in Arizona and she's got a heart of gold. And if you reach out to her and say, oh, Lucy sent us, um, she'll be like, um, she'll, okay. be, she'll be more than helpful to point you in the right direction and things. Her name is Peggy George. And you. You, can send, you can send her a message on Twitter. Oh, I don't have Twitter. Is she on Facebook uh, or Instagram? She's on Facebook. She's on Facebook for sure. Um, um, here, I'll tweet to her right now. Um, and she also does a webinar series called Classroom 2.0 every Saturday at noon or something like that. Oh, That's wow. totally free. I was going to talk about it next week. Um, Okay, so we'll see if she responds tonight or tomorrow. But I just sent her a tweet, and she, she's online all the time. She goes to every free professional development th event that I see online. And she's just got a heart of gold. She'll do anything to help people. Oh, wow. And she used to be a principal. Um, I don't know what she does um, now. You know, I mean, I, I, she's got to be, I don't know how old she is. She's in her, at least her 70s. Um, and I think she's, you know, having a little bit more health issues as she gets older. So she's not, you know, like she doesn't come to our big ed tech conference that's around the country anymore. She used to. It's just too, they're usually, these conferences are just too huge and overwhelming. Um, but she came to the Rio Salado thing that we did last year. She was there in person. She's great. All right. Wow. Thank you. And we'll, we'll talk more next week about PD because I think once you... Once you get the bug, you can't stop. Like it's, and there's, there are people out there who want to help. I think, you know, the, my new school, I don't think there's a mentality. I think all the teachers are really, they're really, they sound like they're really good. I haven't met them all yet. They're really good. They're focused on the curriculum. They're working with the kids and the relationships and building relationships with kids. And they're really focused on their practice. And there's not a lot of, going and looking and seeing what other schools are doing. That's a huge benefit. Right. You know, like when you can, you can get inspiration from seeing other teachers in practice. I think they go to conferences, but they typically kind of, you know, if they're a science teacher, they go to the, the National Science Teacher Association conference. There's not necessarily a lot yeah. of how are we sharing, and, then, and, yeah. and, and the fact that we're sharing also brings benefits to us personally. Like that I, I, I'm not sure if they're, they're there in their district, development. My new district that I work in, I yeah. just get tired of hearing, oh, there's not enough money for that. Oh, there's not enough money. I mean, for something so simple as like a webinar or training or to go to a conference. And I'm just not used to that where I came from. But since I've been here, it's like very limiting. Like, like you need something or ask for something for your classroom. Oh, well, we don't have money for that. So. It's depressing. And you know what? When I first started teaching in Chicago Public Schools, I would get, you know, this is 19, oh, when did I start teaching? 1990, 1990. You know, I might be lucky to go to a professional development event um, in a hotel ballroom. You know, like a traveling reading specialist would do a PD, all day PD thing, and it would cost about $100. Right. I'll pay them thousands of dollars to come and do that, but I mean, really? And, and, and here's the thing is that, you know, really progressive schools realize we have talent in our district. So maybe we don't have money 
but we can have a, an all day professional development day and do a mini conference with it with our own staff. Like there are ways to be creative with this without spending like $5 million. And, you know, also if they reduce costs in other ways, they can reallocate that money. I think it's all about effective leadership. You know, I, I don't think that school district I was talking about in Alabama has a ton of money, but they've done things like they've reduced printing and in and, and costs for that sort of thing. And they, they've found ways to make things happen. That's what good leaders do. Uh, what district is, uh, which one, the, the, the Alabama one? Ruby, is that what you're asking? Let's see if I can tell, uh, there it is. This was a school that I was super impressed with. Um, I interviewed five schools and I was, in, I was impressed with all of them, five districts, but they're, they're all at kind of different stages. This one is super sophisticated in terms of its approach to things. And then the other one that I thought was, um, and oh, this Vancouver, Washington school superintendent. Um, oh my gosh, you know what he does? You know that show Dirty Jobs? <laughs> He goes out with oh yeah he goes out with like people in the district and does their job for a day to learn what they're doing. So in one of them, he went out with a guy who car who collects all the garbage around the district and helped them one day the whole day. And they and they did a video on their YouTube channel about it. And then and he talks about how, what it means and and now he realizes this and that and it gives him perspective and it builds rapport between him and his employees. Um, and then he also went to, he taught kindergarten for a day. Like, doesn't that, like if you saw your superintendent or your principal taking the time to get to know the community like that, um, it makes a difference for morale and everything. And they, in their perspective changes. So um, this district was also, this is a, another huge district, super impressive. And I have no idea where I found the video about the superintendent, but it cracked me up. Um, and so, you know, there are places, I think, before you get locked into a district, my advice would be look around and see what's the best possible place that you can land and how, what you need to do to get there. Um, in Chicago Public Schools, um, I taught at schools that were considered pretty good. And the mentality was, why would you ever leave? Because the fear was you would end up in some hell hole. And, uh, you know, someplace worse. And, and there was always, and, and, and before I started working in CPS, they assigned you to school. So you had no choice where you went. And then when I started working there, they gave some schools leeway to hire their own staff. Um, and that was ridiculous. I mean, so anyway, I, you know, uh, and then I ended up working for, I went and got my master's degree and worked for a private school. Um, but I realized that conditions matter and how well I can do my job and, and how um, I can thrive. And it's really, you know, if, if something doesn't, you know, finding the right fit for yourself in a school or district is really important. And I don't think we, we coach pre-service teachers enough in this, you know. And sometimes you have to that take. That is so that. true. That is so. True. Yeah, and it, it's and it's not you. Like I, I, I assumed that all teachers would be aligned with me philosophically about how kids should be treated. No way. Uh, a lot, you know, when I the second school I taught in, they all thought kids should be seen and not heard. And um, wow. and you know, so so you you want to make and, it, it, and it's really hard to know before you get into a school what it's going to be like, but you can network with people and say what's the story with the school um you know you can re read reviews of it in various places you can you know look at their twitter feed in 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 their social media presence and their website and get a feel for what they are um you can kind of at least uh at least kind of figure out what looks good to you might what might be a good match and it's sometimes it's hard to get into some school districts but you never know until you try it, right? And I know there's only one person left, 
but um, maybe we could bring this up next week too. One one of the things I would suggest for those who are seeking um, starting already set a standard of what you want and like what are your non-negotiables because it's so easy to kind of like get forced into something just because you want to get a job you yeah you want to get that experience and then you feel stuck and you kind of have compromised like what you would or would not do even as a teacher yeah you know? i so, agree i agree so. yeah I was 22 when I started teaching, or 23, and I didn't know any better, and I thought I had to do this, you know, and um, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about my career path, it, and I'm not, I, I love where my career has taken me, um, but it wasn't very intentional at first, so you know, my advice to you guys is, as you, as you progress here is to be intentional with what you're doing and how, you're, how you can make your... <laughs> make your goals happen but we can talk more about that next week um ruby are you good with everything okay good you guys are awesome i love these conversations and um i hope it's been helpful to you and um i'll get the recording up i have to catch up with the recordings i'll probably get them up tomorrow night okay um thanks for everything Thank and have a great night, and I will see you next week. Bye, everyone.